Access Live with Kevin Rankin. Hey, everybody. Thank you for showing up here on Tuesday, May 10th. We uh, are on episode 247 of All Access Live now, and we just passed the two-year mark, so I appreciate you being here. If you are here anywhere else other than YouTube, I would love it if you do me a favor. Go to the link below at youtube.com slash all access live with kevin rankin hit the subscribe button and hit the bell you'll be notified about all my upcoming guests which i've got several let me tell you a little bit about a couple of the guests that i've got coming up uh tomorrow this amazing band that i saw in bristol england when we were on tour last month called erica uh three-piece band younger dudes they're amazing these songs are super super hooky um they opened this show for us and i was really bummed that i didn't get to see more of them so You'll get a chance to get to know these gentlemen from the UK. And then on uh, the 18th, I've got this amazing Paralympic gold medalist, Megan Blunk. She won gold medals in the Olympics for her um, Paralympic basketball team. And she does a lot of spoken um, engagements to work on overcoming adversity and uh, depression and a lot of things that our, uh, our guest today is going to be talking about. So that's the 18th. And on the 25th, Jordan Canada. If you're a drummer out there, you've probably seen this guy's clips. He's got viral drum clips that uh, that will blow your mind. He's in a band, Adrenaline Mob, a wicked rock drummer, and uh, he's got a lot of great stories. So he's on the 25th. On the 30th, you guys know the first ever rap band on the planet, Sugar Hill Gang. So I've got Master G. He's going to come in and talk about Rapper's Delight and Apache and uh, all the stuff that's gone on in the last 35 years with hip-hop and rap. We just did a cruise with them in the Bahamas. And uh, i got to tell you, man, this guy is uh he's a fireball he's got great stories and then right after him actually on the seventh um doug wimbish of uh, living color will be on the show doug was also the bass player from sugar hill gang so we'll get uh, both sides of that hip-hop stuff living color stuff you'll see all those if you go to accesskevin.com and you can see um, upcoming guests you'll see an archive of today's show and uh, and look through the past 246 other episodes that i've had so now i would love before we get started, to thank my sponsors, Five Star Guitars, based in Beaverton, Oregon. They have no sales tax, so if you're out of state and you want to save some money, go to this link below, fivestargutars.com slash allaccesslive, and everything you see there, you're going to save 15% if you use the promo code of allaccess15. So uh, let them know that I sent you, and uh, they'll appreciate having that support. Also, if you're a drummer and you want to go uh, go rock some drums, best drum shop of the West Coast, Rhythm Traders, been around for over 30 years. They've got repairs and lessons from incredible pros, um, best deal on gear, and you're going to save 10% if you use the uh, All Access Live name when you check out. And also, there's no sales tax there too. So I'm saving you a bunch of money. If you want to support me and save, uh, send me some dough, you can send it to Vendo. Kevy Metal. That's the easiest way. You can hit it right there. There's even a QR code that I'll put up in a second. But the greatest vinyl shop on the planet is also based here in Oregon, Music Millennium. Go to musicmillennium.com. They've got all sorts of great stuff, including uh, some upcoming material from my next guest. I, we'll see if this is still his favorite band, but we talked about this band a long time ago. Um, so speaking of my guest, this guy and I met, I believe, over 15 years ago. And uh, he's got an amazing story. Some of you guys might think that you know his story from um, some tumultuous times in the NFL. But since then, he's gone on to not only redeem himself, but he's passed on a lot of really incredible um, messages to people that have, um, uh, you know, we've all had some over adversity to overcome. And I think um, he's got an upcoming engagement that we'll talk about. So tons of stuff to talk about. But um, get to know him like you've never done so before. I have with me. Tony Mandrich. Tony, how you doing, my man? Fantastic. How are you, my man? I'm good, man. <laughs> I did a huge sales pitch there. but uh, <laughs> you, you did? Now I got to live up to it. <laughs> yeah. and, you know what? The last time that, uh, that we even really had a chat, I was uh, I was playing a zoo in your hometown there. That's Florida. right. That's right. That's right. And then you got hung up backstage, and, and I think, because we were supposed to meet you out front after. Yeah. And yeah, well, I'm like, hey, he's a rock star. What do you expect? <laughs> Let me tell you about that. That night, my dad was at that show. It was the first time he'd seen me play since um, I got married in 92. Right. And um, I don't know if you could tell when I was playing, man, but I was in tears. It was a really crazy thing to see. Wow. Uh, to see him off to the Pretty special. It was amazing. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, as parents age, yeah. Too, yeah. I was just in Montana until about 3 o'clock this morning. And uh, right. getting back to, to my parents, that 
yeah, it wasn't like I was partying backstage. Right, but, right. Uh, really, really cool photos from that night, and um, and I appreciated being there. You know, absolutely. Um, that was a blast. God, you know, I was thinking about this. Do you uh, do you have to do these kind of presentations with a widescreen to be able to get your shoulders into? <laughs> <laughs> Man, I tell you what, if my shoulders were half as wide as they used to be, <laughs> it's a it's a sign of you know it's a sign of age and wisdom. Right. You know, it's kind of like, you know, don't push it too hard at this at this point. There's no reason to and just kind of try to keep some tone and strength for functionality and take it from there. You don't exactly look like you're, you know, like uh, you've put on COVID pounds, man. You look solid as a rock. I feel good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wish that I could say, you know, that this is all just amazing. <laughs> well, <laughs> layers and layers, you know? well, what's the old saying? The the freshman 15 or the sophomore 20, it's like the COVID 25. And, yeah. you know, it's, uh, you know, I just, it, you know, it really came down to like, I, I never thought I would ever say this, but a comfort level of, I don't feel comfortable at 300 pounds anymore. And, you know, I found, I didn't know what the magic number would be. I didn't know if it'd be 280, 250, what it is. And, you know, today it's between, it hovers between 275 and, or 270 and 275. But I, you know what, I think it's going to end up being even lower. Yeah. Well, I would imagine, I mean, you're still a young pup, you know, but as you get to. Yeah, age, not that young. 50, 55 is not that young. Well, I mean, when you get to an age where your bones can no longer handle yeah. the structure, right? Yeah. It, yep. Uh, you know, first of all, yeah, Steve Brown, I see you in the chat there, man. My buddy's, uh, he's the drummer for Tesla. He's going on, on stage right now in Maine. So thanks for checking in at least for a second, buddy. Um, those guys, you know, I, well, I mentioned this at the beginning that um, you are a huge, uh, you are a huge Guns N' Roses fan. Yeah, yeah. Are you still a hardcore GR I, fan? I am. I, I am. I mean, to me, like they're the greatest. You know, to say they're the greatest of all time would be you, you can't say that. You can't really say that about anybody. I don't believe because times change and things are different. There are like those ultra great bands, but to me, Tesla, one of the most awesome like i don't know if calling them a hair band is an insult or or not but like some people it depends on how they look at it to me they're one of the great greatest bands around and they have some of my most favorite songs well you wouldn't call gnr a hair band either right? no no but they started that way with the hair right and you know tesla then you know what i love about them is t-shirt jeans man those yep. guys fuck out unapologetic everything they did yep. about music you know and yep. they never you know you wouldn't see you know makeup and eyeliner and you know, oh man they were they were they are i mean they were some of the songs and like the way it is and yes. just oh man just like stuff today that just takes you right back to 30 years where you were when you heard it you're like mechanic what was it called that album mechanical resonance you got it buddy listen dude to i'm it. telling you man that stuff was awesome look at this tony <laughs> He knows. <laughs> modern day cowboy, right? Tony Mandridge. But, yep. uh, um, you know what's crazy about this is the last three times that Guns N' Roses have come around the Pacific Northwest. Uh, one of my best friends, it's GNR is his favorite band on the planet. He right. uh, and he got tickets for me to go with him, and each time I've had to be on tour. I've missed. Oh. Him time. I've never seen him. And right. I, I, but I'm sure you've seen him a bunch of times. Right? I have. I've. I have. I've been lucky to see the original crew. And then, you know, and then a couple of decades go by, then you get to see the revamped guns. Yeah. Um, now, I haven't seen them since they've been, since they've got the band back together. <laughs> well, almost back together, right? Almost, right, right. But they've got the majority of them. Steven Adler, not, but, no, yeah. you know, he was, he was an OG. If Adler and Gilly Clark were there, then yeah. it would be pretty awesome to see. Yeah, them. it would be. It would be. They're... I'm sorry, uh, Izzy Stradlin. Sorry. Oh, Izzy Stradlin, yeah, because Gilby Clark took Gilby Clark, I think, took Stradlin's spot, and then he he lasted quite a long time, but then you know he went his way too. Man, I, you know, I've I've certainly met Adler a bunch of times. I met Duff a handful of times, um, Slash as well, and you know my my pal that got us tickets. He's he's always telling this long story about his experience with Ad, Axel. Right. Said, oh yeah, man, it's it's amazing. It'll, it'll change your life. Um, you know, back hanging out because he was a radio guy. He said, right. back, back by the buses. And, uh, you know, this entourage comes in and girls come off the bus first and Axel comes off and looks at him. <laughs> and he said, hey, Axel. I said, but, uh, 
<laughs> he was being too cool, apparently. <laughs> you know what, man? I mean, I, I, um, you know, your book talks about some of this a little bit, right? About yeah. about ego and, and getting caught up in the the whole head mm-hmm. game that goes along with NFL entertainment in general, right? Rock and roll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, when you and I first met, do you remember the first time? Um, was it with was it? Yeah, it was with him. Yeah, uh, uh, April Morgan and I, and yeah, 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 and Ken. And Ken, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to make sure that I had the right because it was a and it was a celebrity thing, wasn't there? Uh, some well, there was that, but then we went out to dinner one time, and um, and at dinner, I remember that was where I for for really we got the chance to to sit down to talk and talk to you and your wife, and I was blown away by your humility. You know, we talked a little bit about, you know, hometown uh, NFL, you right. know, like a buddy, Mike Vanderjat at that point. Right, 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 right. right. Yeah. You're kind of just starting to come off the rails for him at that point. And yeah. It'd be interesting. To, have, have you talked to Mike at all? Do you, have you, do you I, I have not. I have not kept in touch with Mike. Um, there was, you know, I had, I had worked for one of the Canadian um, major networks. And I shouldn't even really say like, it, I don't want to make it sound like I worked for them. Every Monday I would come in for two hours and be with their, one of their main hosts. And we would basically talk about NFL games that happened on Sunday. So it would only be during the fall. Okay. So that's at the time when I had the golf course. Oh. And so I would drive down to Toronto Monday nights and go to the, the network and we would talk and, there was a miscommunication where he thought I said something about him or his mom had heard that I had said something like about him on the network that was critical. And, and I, and I was like, no, I think it got blown out of proportion. I think, you know, I think he blew it out of proportion because I said, let's roll the tape. And I, I, I went and watched it and I didn't say anything critical. So it was like, he was getting secondhand information and you know how that can get embellished. I mean, firsthand information can get embellished on how somebody interprets something, period. Especially now with social media. Yeah. 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 uh, Well, I I just, the only reason I asked was, um, you know, sometimes in the NFL, especially, you know, there's, it seems like the media just wants to know about the next big thing, right? And oftentimes it's controversy or it's, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'm still, you know, hardcore NFL guy, but I, yeah, yeah. 20 year season ticket holder for my Seahawks. And right. This is a tough year for us, man. I mean, really, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, losing I, Russell and the, the worst, you know, I, yeah. um, I, I was equating that with the, the death of a family member. And I know that sounds really silly, but, um, I, I just, I realized how much I appreciated what he brought to that team off the field. You know, and, and the community, right? The community. Yeah, man, he, yeah. he's such a yeah. good guy. And he was yeah. in the hospital every week, you know, working with children. And yeah. and so, uh, but then the thing that saved me for that was knowing that that stuff will continue. Maybe not in a local community, but because of the type of person he is, he's still going to go out there and he's going to make a difference off the field. Absolutely. And so, so I can respect it and it just won't be, unfortunately, on the field. Yeah. The team. But yeah. You know, do you follow NFL a lot still? Are you? You know, I, I, I did all the way until COVID. And then when COVID hit and, you know, that season kind of was a hit and miss. So I, I was kind of like, you know, why are we playing football on a Wednesday night? <laughs> I was like, why are we watching? So I, I just kind of was like, it's a, it's a, it's just crazy. So I, I kind of was like, I stopped watching it just for the COVID year. And then we kind of had that almost second COVID season. Right. Um, so I still watched it. I mean, I watched the Super Bowl and the playoffs and everything, but I wasn't as into it as like this last fall, there was some normalcy back. Right. So, you know, and, and hopefully this fall there'll be, you know, things a lot more back to normal and, and, you know, my interest will be peaked again. Sure. The, I, having been such a huge part of your life, you know, I would imagine that there are guys that were part of your life in football that you stay in touch with. Yep. And, um, and also, you know, I think about music for me. I mean, it, it, I, not to be at your level by any means, but I the the relationships I've developed in the music industry with other bandmates and 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 guys in other bands, right, that we're traveling with. Yeah. Those those are lifelong things. Yeah. I don't ever 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 lose contact with those people because they mean so much to me. But there's also part of the music industry, just like any entertainment. <laughs> 
yeah, man, I could walk away from that part of it and be okay with you know, the less drama. Than that, right? The football is the same. <laughs> you know what? I believe, I think it's like that in every job, like especially if it's if you're living your life on the you know say front page or where if there's controversy or something happens, it could be on the front page, whether it's with music or or sport. But um, there's definitely guys and coaches. And then people that you've met, like that are de definitely directly related to the game that you will never forget ever in your life. Um, and it's like, and you know, look, there's guys I keep in touch with. There's guys I'll see next week in Michigan when I go back to talk um, that like one of my old roommates, John Buddy, um, I'll see him and, and you know, I, we're going to catch up. I mean, we're always like, he's always nagging me. He's like, when you come to Michigan, just, just to hang out. He's like, he literally, we had a conversation six months ago on the phone and we were like, do you ever just miss hanging out and doing like, and just BSing? Yeah. You know? And, and, and I was like, yeah, we can talk about the good old days and how great we were <laughs> and lie to each other. <laughs> and, you know, jokingly I said that, but you know what? It's that the biggest thing I miss from football I mean, game day is awesome, but the camaraderie yeah. and that's, and that comes from, you know, off season, weight training, spring, you know, mini camps, the draft, all that summer training. And then once you start going to camp and, and then you have football season. And then when you start repeating that, when you have the core group of guys that, you know, aren't free agents or aren't being traded or cut or released, you start developing a relationship that that lasts, you know, forever with some of these guys. It's even more so now. I mean, the way, the way that people are cut now, I mean, yeah. it's ridiculous, you know, and, and yeah. it's kind of, for me, it's a, it's a drag. I'm, you know, I, I, it's hard to build allegiances on the team so much when yeah. your favorite players go, but you know, you talked about a, a couple of guys that, um, you know, between coaches and players, mm -hmm. um, tell me about a coach that just really inspired oh. you from the beginning. I tell you, there's a man, there's a list of them, but like, the two of them that were probably the biggest that in, you know inspired influenced me and inspired me were uh, my former head coach at Michigan State George Perlis who passed away over over a year ago, um, and then our offensive line coach at Michigan State at that time under George Perlis was Buck Nystrom and he's iconic in in college football, and he just passed away like I want to say six months ago, Man. and it's like you know. This may sound cheesy, but it's the truth. When they both died, even though they died at separate times, a little piece of me died. Oh, yeah. Because the way they, like, some of the things they said and some of the, like, and some of the, I mean, just the way they coached, the things they did, the discipline they, you know, demanded and, and, and the structure and the accountability and all these things that we're missing today in society... <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I have to talk about myself too, right? And, and my accountability and my responsibility, because I have a responsibility too. Sure. So it's not, it's, it's, you know, I, I've always kind of said not, and not to veer off, but I've always kind of said, if everybody of this 300 and plus million people took accountability for their own shit, yeah. we'd be good. doesn't matter who's president. Well, oh yeah, I mean, you know, it's like we we'd be good. Like we would be in a pretty solid place. Accountability to me has taken on a whole new meaning in the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, and and you and I didn't get a chance to catch up, you know, prior to going live. And so I, uh, I'm very sensitive to um, anonymity and talking about mm -hmm. you know some things that are um, sort of recovery related. Yeah, yeah. And I will say that in my process of recovery that's where the accountability really started to hit home. I mean, as a parent, I recognized how much it meant to be the best representation of, of a father and a parental figure and, and somebody that can lead, you know, and I wish that I had those skills early on. It's stuff that I'm doing yeah. every day, you know, but, yeah. but accountability, man, it's, you know, it's not, obviously it's not just like, you know, the 300 million people we have in the U S but right, right, right. you get outside the U S and you hear people talk about Americans, that's usually the complaint, right? Is the entitlement. And the, yeah, yeah. I can't, <laughs> yeah. And, I, and I can't argue with them, you know? Yeah. Apologizing for them. I like to take those people's perspective and come back here and say, all right, you well, know, there's, there's work that I need to be doing. And, you know, if you can pass that on, 
I'm betting that some of the conversations you'll have in, in Michigan next week, but, and I want to get into that in yeah. a minute. Yeah. But, you know, kind of going back on that conversation we had where, you know, like 15 years ago when we sat down, mm -hmm. your humility was a big part. And you were, you were, um, well, you were eating healthy. You were very healthy at that yeah, time. Is what yeah. Yeah. Working out constantly. Amazing. And, yeah. Uh, you know, in all respects, and you know, you weren't drinking, you weren't, you know, eating junk, and right, uh, and and I was. I mean, that was a phase. Right, 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 right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I made some really poor choices. Right. Uh, you know, I think we all have. Right? We all have. Listen, if if we, I mean, show me somebody who hasn't, we because have. if if they if they haven't, they've probably been living in a cave. The human condition sort of like you know brings us to that. And yeah. what you do with it, right, is, is, yeah. is key. One of the things, and, and if, if it's cool, man, it's just to kind of back up a little bit and talk about mm -hmm. some of those conversations we had, you blew my mind. And then they carried on to the book where you talked about being in college and really the competitive nature of being a football player, how you had to stay at the top of your game mm -hmm. that involved some enhanced, you know, performance enhancing drugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When, I mean, steroids, and that wasn't even, like, the phrase performance-enhancing drugs wasn't even, like, used yet, right? It was, like, the juice, the junk, the gear. I don't think, I don't even think they called it gear. I think now they call it gear, like, in the, in those communities of where people use steroids. But um, it's... Gears related to basically to the hypo hypodermic needle at use, I think, right? So probably, yeah. Who knows? Rock and roll, you hear about the gear. Right? Okay, so you know it's the same slang, the same slang, same effect, yeah. same same effect, and then you chase that effect until you get it again, and you never get it again, and your life just goes, <laughs> you know, and um, it's. Uh, the level of, and you know, don't this, you know, earlier you said something about music and you, you know, you, the music that you were involved with or, and still are involved. And then, but it's not like, you know, like I was in the NFL. It's like, there's really no different. I mean, they're both at the top level of sure. they're, they're at the tier one level of what that sport or industry or genre does of employment or sport. Right. The demand, as you know, to for you to stay in the band you know you could be the greatest drummer in america but because you and the head singer butt heads you know you might be gone you might be the best quarterback in the in the nfl but if you and the owner or somebody butt heads you're gone i mean unless you're i'll use it and then the coach is gone but sorry well but no but but i mean there you go tom brady leaves um new england and goes and wins the Super Bowl. Well, and that's what I was going to say. But then, in order to come back off his retirement from Tampa, oh right, you know, yeah, 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 retires right and just, right, 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 and, right, and, right. That's power. I mean, I'm, I'm yeah, yeah, and that's like an anomaly. <laughs> <laughs> that's a Mick Jagger. Tier <laughs> way beyond where I'm. If I have, I have an issue with lead singer. All of a sudden. The lead singer's gone, and I'm the, you know, that's right. <laughs> well, I've never had the problem where it's been an issue between me and the quarterback, and the quarterback's game been gone. Listen, yeah. offensive linemen are, are very replaceable. God, man. well, you know, when but, you're in, in the midst of your thing, yeah. you, you know, um, I, you know, I, what I'm trying to do is make sure that I don't give away a whole lot from your book. Because oh, it doesn't, you can, it, you won't, you can, you don't have to hold anything back. The book is fascinating. And the, the, honestly, man, the progression of having to use and telling these stories, wow, that I can laugh at them now. And I'm sure, man, that it may be comedic to you now, but, yeah. you, know, you know, like the squeeze toys, you know, the squeeze. Oh, toys. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that whole, talk about account, lack of accountability. Well, and but it's not you, just you that was doing it. Well, I can only talk about my accountability. Okay. <laughs> right. All right. So, like, all right, give me your experience, strength, and hope, Tony. Let's <laughs> like, like, I mean, you want rule number one. Rule number one in in my book has always been, you know, since I've been sober, I should say. And actually, there was a part of this loyalty, if you'll call it, 
before I got sober. But once I got sober, once I came around the rooms and once I started doing 12 step, once I started expanding my view of the world and started figuring out, you know what? I don't have all the answers. And then it became like, you know what? You don't have hardly any of the answers, you know? Yeah. So you start to then listen and start to pick, you know, you choose what works with you and, and stuff like that. But I, I mean, listen, I, I was sitting in Detroit at a treatment center in 19, this is March of uh, 95. Okay. And we're in our first group session. They finally let me out of detox. I was in detox for four days and they felt I was fairly stable. I wouldn't like go into a seizure because they had the phenobarbital. And I'm in a group session of like 10 people that are in there, inpatients. And the lady guiding the session, um, very eloquently speaking, and um, she was probably a little bit older than me. And so she was probably 30, young 30s. And she said, as she's the counselor running the group, and she's like, you know, before we started, I just want to say this so everybody can hear it. She's like, your best thinking of building your empires got you into this treatment center. And I'll tell you what, that was a Louisville slugger across the head. Yeah, you heard it then? I heard it then. I was like, I had heard it before. Like, I hadn't heard that phrase, but when she said that, you felt it. I was like, oh my God, she's right. Like she, cause, cause I started thinking of the last five years prior to that. And I was like, you know, my brain was scrambling, thinking of what well, I plan to do this, plan to do this. And how'd that work out? How'd that work out? And I'm like, and then it all led up to me sitting in this chair in a treatment center. Yeah. I mean, so 95, cause you were drafted in 89, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that six year span, a yep. lot of stuff went down right in that time. Yep. When you mentioned like hearing it then, I mean, really hearing it, right? Like it, where it's, yeah. like, it's four days of detox. That's kind of where your brain seems like it'd be mush, right? I mean, you're just yeah. like, you're in survival mode at that point. Yeah. Right? Yep. But take me back, you know, to a couple of those years prior. So, you know, you, cause, because there was some steroid use in college, right? And, and your dad, he got nailed for that. Yeah. Well, no, actually I, I didn't. Well, I, like more consequences, right? Well, the, <laughs> no, there definitely were consequences later in life. Oh, yeah, but, but, sure. but, but I never got like, um, you know, when, like I never got caught for using steroids. Okay. I never tested positive anywhere ever for using steroids. Ever. So ever. But okay. the testing, the testing in college football then was you, you only kind of got tested if you made it bowl game. So if we're at mid season and we're like three and six, it's like, I'm not concerned, but if we're winning, I'm watching what I'm taking, like uh, and trying to figure out, you know, do the whole, I'm a doc, mad, mad scientist, you know, what's oil based, what's water based, what's going to be out of my system quicker. If we make a bowl game, you know, things like that. So, um, Did you get help. I mean, like, uh, and without incriminating anybody, but I mean, are there guys on the inside that are kind of saying, Hey man, you know, cause I know when I got sober, you know, I kept watching guys that were trying to cheat the system all the time. You know, you got to blow right. up your car, you know, right, right, right. And, and I was thinking, man, I don't, <laughs> even I don't want to get caught. I don't want to risk it. But right. For me, you know, I mean, I spent my time in jail the night that I got a DUI 10 years mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. And my kids were just becoming teenagers. I never drank before I had kids because I saw the, the damage of alcohol and drugs growing right. up. And I did right. not want to be that guy. And right. then life got challenging as a parent. And that yeah. was when I started drinking. Right. And so it, I did a lifetime's worth of drinking in about 12 years. Yeah. And, and I remember getting a DUI after business meeting. It wasn't even I was out partying, right? Right, and I, right. And so it was fortunate that I hadn't gotten busted a million times because there had been times where I was right. out on the road. And when I when I sat in a cell and I thought about my kids, mm -hmm. who were predisposed to be alcoholics, man, because mm -hmm. they on all sides of my family. Yeah. I thought it, that's where things hit me. You know, I, I, yeah. was, I barely blew, you know, point oh eight. I mean, I was just like, and a lot of my friends, they're like, that's a rite of passage for rock and roll, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's a prerequisite. <laughs> you know, 
one DUI? What the right. hell? And, right. uh, but it right. was it for me. I mean, I, cause I, I thought if there's anything that I can do right as a parent is to at least set that example. Right. Yeah. And so when I'm thinking about all those people that were trying to cheat the system, I'm sure in the NFL that, you know, you're getting, you're hearing from buddies that are saying, oh man, you know what, if you do this and you, you know, you, you, right. you dilute it with whatever. Right. Right. Um, and so, so I'm guessing that there's a lot of, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't know, other than what I read in your book, you know, right, this is right. a long time ago that I got your right. book, but I remember just some of the, the, the lengths that you would go to, man, to get oh. clean piss in you. It just, it was crazy. It was a full-time job. Do I remember right that like you were injecting somebody's clean piss in your bladder? Is that no, right? no, that wasn't my story. Okay. All right. No, no, no. We had a, I, I should say I had a, uh, I did like the doggy toy thing that you had referred to earlier, you know, strapping it to your back, putting someone's clean urine in it. Yeah. Although, you know, and uh, listen, it doesn't matter how you do it. You're cheating yourself. Yeah. But, but the, the procedure that you're talking about was very common. God. I, I was so sane that I thought to myself, why would I want to inject somebody else's urine in my bladder? That's crazy. Right. Like who would do that? <laughs> right yeah. like, like, so you know and, and then you look back and you go you know you just shake your head and you go what were you thinking it's all insanity right? you know it is the hindsight being more clear but yeah yeah man i mean when when it was going on and and when you were seeing um this progression of mm -hmm. where like, your body's breaking down where where because also, I mean, leading up to it too, I mean, there was, there was an addition of, of, you were basically recreating Axel Rose, right? On the football field. Right? Yeah. Was, you know, I, th I, mean, I, I was, I right. thought I was trying to, <laughs> <laughs> I think I fell quite a bit short. <laughs> well, I mean, you've been humbled a little bit too. Right? Yeah. 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 Of, yeah. But I mean, the guy shows up on time and plays a three hour show now. So he, he obviously he's done something right. Right. You know? Right. And, right. But when along the way, were you catching yourself and do you have people like, uh, you know, agents or managers or anybody in line that were saying, Hey man, you know, you're not doing yourself a favor. Right. Where did you have anybody looking out for you? That way? I did, you know, I did. Um, there were, there were a lot of people assuming that I was on the stuff on, on the steroids. Um, my trainers at Michigan state, um, sat me down one day and had a conversation with me about, you know, or they literally came out and asked me if I wasn't, I, you know, totally denied it. And, uh, they said, well, even if you're not, and they, I think they knew I was, uh, they said they went through like the, look, you have to, like, there's these consequences that you will happen to you physically and health wise and all these things when you're 30 and stuff. Right. And like, who knows when, anytime, and I'm thinking to myself, this is probably where I was the closest to ever being like a rock star. I probably thought, to, and I thought to myself, I'll never reach 30. I'm not worried about 30, <laughs> you know? And I, and I think I was so cocky that I literally said that to them. I said, well, first of all, I don't have to worry about it because I'm not on it. But second of all, uh, you know, I'm, the way I'm living fast, weightlifting crazy and all that stuff and um, crazy at practice and like every day was full speed and that's not the way to do it. Like, that's not the way to do it. There's, there's a, there's a time and place for full speed and for work, but you know, I think kind of like the phrase has evolved over time of work smart, not just hard, but work hard and smart where I was like full speed all the time. And, and that, that'll catch up to you. Yeah. Even without drugs. Yeah. And really. Yeah. And, and, and substances. I mean, I, yeah. I think the uh, the idea, you know, better to burn out than to fade away. Yeah, you know, that has been my mantra from a long time. And I yeah, know that during the COVID phase, that was the first time I think in my life where I was forced to slow down, right, and evaluate. And so even though I might have been um, sober, right, there were all sorts of reflections that I got to do. You know, I I I I, so I was selfish in my time where I was spending every day out in the woods with my dog. Mm. This little brindle pug with a purple mohawk, and that dude and I became so right. he's my right. son, you know, and and um, and I noticed with him, 
there's nothing else going on in the world. He didn't care about politics or what happened yesterday or even right. what happened tomorrow. That guy is so present, right? Right. And so my focus during that time, during COVID, was how can I be centered right here, right yeah. now? And the yeah. ultimate sort of concept of any recovery program yeah. right, is because so much stuff's out of, out of our control. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. If, if there's ever been a time when we had to recognize that shit is outside our control, man, you know, and and uh, and you got to be able to let go. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm really grateful for that. I mean, that one silver lining that I could see in, in the pandemic was forcing me to slow down and reflect on that. Yeah. And, and how about for you? I mean, what, what was, I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was, you know, no, I did. I did. The funny thing was, I, you know, I spent a lot of time by myself, you know, and so the first like three months of the pandemic or when they kind of like locked everything down, yeah. like, like I could, my lifestyle didn't change at all. Oh, really? okay. <laughs> it was like, you know, it was like, okay, well, I can't go out to eat, but I wasn't really going out to eat much anyway. Okay. So I'd like to, you know, I would do whatever kind of work. Obviously it affected both of my work things, which yeah. was photography and uh, public speaking. Right. So like those went to like almost nil, yeah. you know, so it was, so then I was like, well, you know what, here's a great time to get creative and start brainstorming ideas for self assignments for photography. Okay. It's also a time I could improve my vocabulary and or my public speaking skills, polish them up, you know, or learn something new over this time. And, you know, being lucky, I, I, I feel I was lucky being in Arizona, because we were only locked down eight weeks, the whole pandemic. That's right. Yeah. Was... You know, and we had our things where it was like for a while you could only pull up to a restaurant and get takeout. Mm -hmm. But, and then there was like the inside seating. And then, heck, I think I went to California probably a year after the pandemic. And we were kind of like almost 100% open already for months. Right. And I went to California and it was like going to a different country. Right, yeah. <laughs> I was like, what, what's I'm going gonna, on? I'm going to back you up for a second because I want to know your opinion about this. You said you were lucky that you were in Arizona. I am of the firm belief that for the most part, when, when I've referred my, to myself as lucky in the past, I realize it's more fortunate than luck. Right. I yeah. Mean, you put yourself in Arizona. Yeah. There's, but you know, it wasn't like, um, you know, like boom, some, some, uh, right. And being came down and just dropped you in you know, right. Arizona. There's right. a reason you're there. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so you, because of that, it's more fortunate. Well, it, and, and you know what makes it even more fortunate? And this is good. This is a joke. Okay. <laughs> but when I saw all this stuff going on in Portland, I was like, I'm so glad I'm in Arizona. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, before the pandemic, people were like, oh, Arizona, the Wild West, people carrying around guns and stuff. And I was like, I feel safer with people here carrying guns yeah. than other places, you know. And that's yeah. not to poke fun, but it's, no, you know, to, yeah. to make it, you know, I mean, there was some stuff going on that was dangerous. I mean, Portland definitely got tons of media. It was the whole West Coast was kind of yeah. bad, but Portland... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's still there's some some really difficult stuff to, to yeah. see going on, and yeah. uh, you know I've had a lot of conversations about it on this show. You know, it's yeah. hard being able to like your lifestyle changed for me. This podcast would never have happened if it weren't for the pandemic. right, right. Like, my guys in the band, we we did a show right at the beginning of the pandemic in Vancouver, BC, and we kept hearing about this flu that was over in. In, in China, right? And, right, right. And uh, so I went to Chinatown in Vancouver and 25% of the businesses were closed for good. At that point, this is the third week of February before Whoa. they even announced what it was. Whoa. Thought, Come on, man. This thing's never coming over here like this, right? Right. And then it became, well, okay. So we took a little time off and our guitarist and I jumped on Facebook Live and we said, yeah, these gig cancellations, I mean, this might go on a month or two. Uh, what are we going to do? And here we are, two plus <laughs> But what, what I'm grateful for, yeah. the reconnection, like you and I, mm -hmm. and man, I mean, I, we played in, in Arizona with Phoenix, Mesa, you know, Tempe, Tucson, yep. you know, a bunch of times. But like you, I mean, you know, we're always on the go. It's yeah. like, you know, you're hanging out for a couple of days. Right. You know, the the ability to reconnect where just yeah. like you and your other buddies from the NFL, you know, like, man, yeah. don't you just kind of miss just yeah. getting to BS a little bit? Yeah. Selfishly. 
that's what the show is for me. And I learned so much more about people that I really valued for their, you know, yeah. university and their, their, their projects. You know, I mean, yeah. the, the stuff that you and I got to talk about at dinner that many years ago stayed right. with me. Right. That's awesome. It is. I mean, that's well, all. I mean, I'm so grateful to hear that because it, it like for me personally, it's like, it's always like, you know, be careful what you share with people and what you say, because you never know how it can affect them negatively or positively. Sure. So, you know, it's like, okay, well then always stick to the truth, like stick to the truth. It makes things a lot simpler. Hey man, I, I, you know, I probably overshare sometimes because mm -hmm. there is a boundary uh, that you kind of got to watch, but yeah, but I am so open you know i i met this amazing beautiful woman eight months ago and i'm so madly in love but my first things with her were like look i'm giving you full disclosure if you right. with me you get me warts and all and she heard everything and i remember her saying <laughs> wow okay um this is a lot to unpack you know right i thought I just don't want you to have to waste your time. I was, I was, you know, floored by it. And, right. and, and so for me, honesty, man, is, is that's the accountability part. Right? It is. Yeah. I, I feel like I've done some things really good in my life. And then there's a lot of mistakes that I've made. And I'm like that with my kids. You yeah. know, I'm, I bet that that has become a real sort of um, foundation for you as a parent. Right? It's like, you know, it, it, it has, I will say this though. I mean, again, don't want to, I don't want to overshare, but I have to go like, I would feel like a hypocrite if I didn't share this right at this point, I'm 55 years old. Um, you know, my oldest daughter's in her younger thirties. Uh, you know, my youngest daughter is in her almost mid twenties. Okay. And our relationship right now, like has been, so challenged mm. like in the last two years two and a half years i mean like to the to the point where i've never i i could never see this coming like i could never imagine it being this bad wow so you know the the thing that i will default to always is um what role did i play okay. in in this whole thing because Cause I have to look at the whole thing. I can't just look at, you know, what they said or if they're pointing the finger, it's like, you know, they're pointing the finger and some of the things they are saying, I totally disagree with, but th some of the things they are saying they're spot on, Yeah. you know, and it's, and it's, um, but it's nothing that I didn't know already. Yeah. And, but it just kind of, you know, the evolution happens over time. And then, you know, there's always ups and downs with, your relationship with kids you probably know that already oh, yeah. but but as challenging as this is now um i never imagined it would be this challenging uh and it, it's you know it's like i wouldn't wish it on anybody oh, um and i'm not and, and i love my girls uh, yeah. you know it's like i have nothing bad to say i look today i will i mean and they i think they know this i they if they don't they should um, I've said it to them many times. I said, look, whether we're getting along or not, or whether you hate me or whether you love me or whatever kind of communication or lack of communication we're having, trust me, I will fight to the death for you Yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah, man. They, every parent should take a bullet for their kid. Right? Yeah. And, 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 uh, but it's, you know, it's, it, it's, if I would feel like a hypocrite, if I didn't, if I wasn't transparent with that, with you. Yeah. You know, the thing is, I know how much your kids mean to you, you know, over yeah. the years, man. I mean, that was, they were a central point in, in mm -hmm. everything. And, um, and, and at some, I think I'm just speculating, right? But mm -hmm. when you were younger in your days of playing football, it was all about you, right? I mean, really, yeah. that, that's totally my thing too, right? Playing music, yeah. it was always about me and yeah. the relationship suffered because of that. Yeah. You know, I, and, and not intentionally, you know, I was right. married forever. I was with my girlfriend since we were 12, married 28 years. Right. And, and it wasn't that I was out like wanting to hook up. I just right. shared my attention with everybody on the planet. Right. I didn't have boundaries and right. I'm still working on that. And, yeah. um, but my kids mean everything to me. There are times for sure where 
they want nothing to do with me. And it's right. really tough, you know, because, yeah. uh, because in my heart, you know, I love. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know? And so I, I try to commiserate with your pain. And I yeah. would imagine that if you could do something differently, right. I mean, because the words you could say a million times, but if, right. if uh, you know, if you could sit down with them, right. For yeah. you know, a few hours on end uninterrupted where I thought the rest of the world kind of chiming in and distracting and where they can just see, you know, where your heart is. I would imagine that does a lot of bonding, you know, but I would think, yeah, I would think it would. And I, and I, and, and, you know, and in referring to say, like, like you had mentioned, being able to sit down and, and just to listen to them yeah, because you know what, it's like, I need to hear it on how they saw it too. Because I might not have that perspective, you know, and I've been sober a long time. So it's yeah. like, you know, so it's, there's a lot of, just because you get sober doesn't mean everything's good. Doesn't mean you become a saint. Right. Or right. Everything gets glossy in the world. Right. Exactly. Good. Right. So <laughs> rainbows and unicorns. Right. <laughs> so, so it's, it's, um, it's, 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 it's one of those, I don't want to call it an epic fail because I don't believe it's over. I don't believe it's done. It's, we're just going through an adverse time. My experience in life has always been whether the adversity is a molehill or a mountain, the same amount of greatness comes out the other side. If it was a small adversity, there's going to be a, a nice thing. Once you figure it out and how to get through it, whatever you end up, however you end up walking through it, that's about in proportion to the amount of, you know, more skills that you've gotten to get. Mm. If you go into the deep abyss of an adversity, you know, yeah. the outcome on the other side, you know, and you pray that you get through to the other side is going to be as big going great. Oh, man. So yeah, I, that's the only thing that's, you know, it's kind of like this to me is an abyss yeah. with it's like there's a void they're missing with my kids yeah. so what kind of keeps you going is is okay just keep just make sure they know that you love them make sure all these things because you get through the abyss and you get to the other side and the reward will and i don't want to call it a reward because then it's like you're entitled or you deserve it it's like the outcome will be incredible boy you know i, I was just trying to think about my own situations when you said that and, and i think about your situation i mean you've overcome a ton of adversity in yeah. your life you know really i mean you um the con what i what i love most right from what i'm hearing from you is just this honesty you know that and that was what it was from the beginning man when i first met you you talked about yeah i, I fucked up man you know i had some yeah. really bad choices that i made and you know there was redemption in there um you know recovery was a big part of it going to the Colts, man. I mean, having them take a shot on you, yep. you went out there and you redeemed yourself and you, you know, you, you killed it for them. Man. Yeah. Um, so I would, I would picture that there was an abyss there after the Packers. Right. I mean, that Oh was, yeah. Uh, it was maybe, dark. <laughs> so, like at that point, right. That yeah. was the, the darkest abyss you probably had seen to that point. Right? It, well, it was so dark. It was like, it can't get worse. And then it got worse. Well, I mean, that's yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, you know, in 1989, you're, you're cover SI, all the PR and supposed to be this next great generation of prototype offensive linemen. And, and then in a mere four years later, after your contract is expired, they don't want to resign you. They literally call you and say, we don't want to resign you. And you know, you start going into the abyss already. And I already knew by that time, you know, alcohol and painkillers were a major problem. But I still had all the answers, you know. And then my brother John died at 31 from melanoma, you know. And that, like, he, he dies February 8th of 93. You know, I get released from the Packers in, like, January of 93. And, you know, and then, you know, my parents got divorced, I want to say a year later, and they were married close to 35 years, 40 years, maybe, you know, and that's because of that, you know, like that tragedy, it's either it binds you or after a while, it just stresses you apart. And, you know, that was like a shocker to me because it was like, well, mom and dad are always there. Yeah. 
they've always been there right and it's like now they're the union yeah. yeah and and now they're not so um so that you know so what do i do i just keep medicating more and more yeah instead of you know cleaning myself up and, and straightening out my life I just, you know, go deeper into the abyss of, of drugs and alcohol and numbing my feelings and, and emotions and, you know, the cl lack of clarity that you how you see the world and, um, yeah, the numbing it, you know, it, like yeah. it's interesting and I don't mean to interrupt you at all because this is, this is really key people that don't understand the alcohol and drugs and addiction, they don't get it. And I, and this is not to the point ignorant flag at anybody, but they don't understand that how could you right go to this abyss and then have this happen and that happen and then continue to use but that's exactly why right <laughs> right so right you, right that, right right like who other than you know like pills and booze are going to be there to, to, to take that pain away right Maybe they were my best friend and um, I, I'm going to use this right now. I, I want people to know this. I, this is an important part of my show um, now and then, especially in a show like this. And we'll get into this more. Um, there are a lot of people that for whatever in their life, man, whether they're dealing with alcohol or drugs or any kind of um, addiction issues or mental illness, sadness, depression, anything like this. I want you to take this phone number down. There's 877-726-4727. It's the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services administration crisis line crisis line um, this crisis line is there because those numbers have people behind them that are wanting to be there to listen and they're there to help um, when you feel like the only person there to listen is the bottle or you know pills or whatever it you it's so easy to become isolated when you feel that way and you feel like you're the only person that gets it nobody else could understand that phone number is right there there are people that will not charge you to listen and help you guide that, guide you through that plan. So uh, this process. So one eight seven 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 two six four seven two seven. Write that number down, guys. Because um, but everybody has got these mountains where they feel like it's insurmountable, you know. And what Tony's talking about right now, people have lost. I mean, especially in our age, right? And parents, you know, the loss of parents and uh, siblings and and partners and. I mean, there's a, the pandemic did it too. I mean, there are yeah. so many people that went through major drug and alcohol health crises because oh. their life was turned upside down. Oh. I equated it to this identity crisis for musicians. The only thing they need to do was to entertain and be on stage, right? right. And right. Whether it be, you know, musicians or, you know, Broadway actors, mm -hmm. or filmmakers or, or whomever, right? And yeah. when that stuff is gone, everything that made you, you, or right. fulfilled you is right. gone. You have no identity. You're like, what, right. who am I, right? And so right. people turn to a lot of that stuff. And yeah. um, it's really important that people realize that, you know, there there are people there that want to help. And so you talked about getting to this point where the universe has just continued to hand you this, you know, another blow where you're, yeah. you know, um, at some point you're going to break. Right. I mean, yeah. it's you're going to die or you're going to break. Yeah. Well, I mean, that that truly is. The break. Yeah. I mean, yeah. They, so so when people that don't understand and they think, well, that had to have been your bottom when you were like up in the package and then you lose your brother and then you lose the union of your parents. Right. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and so do you have a defining moment for you where you felt like, yeah, I hit my bottom? Uh, yeah. You know, I, I think I. I think I've went through that already. Yeah. Um, although I will say the, you know, this, this challenging thing with the girls is, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's different, like the same emotions and, and same kind of feelings and you feel uh, less than, or you feel like, you know, I feel less than, I feel like I'm not capable of being the father that they are describing that, you know, that I should have been or wished that I was or whatever. Um, so you think you, that's when you start thinking to yourself, you're an, I'm an epic fail. Sure. You know, and, and it's, so then it's like, okay, well, what are you going to do about it? Is what I ask myself. Like, Your what do you, what are you going to, yep. What's my part in it? 
the, the fact that you even acknowledge this, I mean, the humility and, and the acknowledgement, you said, you know, full disclosure, <laughs> we all know, man, that acknowledging that is the first step and, yeah. and that repairing those kinds of, of issues. And, you know, I, I'm confident that it's going to take some time maybe. Yeah. And I, you know, <clears throat> all I can, all I can do is be, you know, the willingness is huge. You have to be willing for that relationship. And, um, and I pray about it. I pray about it every day. And I don't pray, you know, to God, and I'll call it God, because that's sure. what it is for me. Yeah. I, I don't pray to God and say, hey, I want it to be this way, right? Because <laughs> that's what I did all those years until I got sober. Yeah. So now it's kind of like, you know, I pray about it. I pray for their safety and their health, and that whatever God wants to happen will happen. And, and I have to be willing to accept whatever that is. And if that is, you know, let's go both extremes that, okay, uh, you never talk to them again. That's the worst extreme for me. Or it could go the other extreme. Okay, you mend, you talk, and you grow from it. And then you end up having a better relationship than you've ever had with your kids because of the struggle. Yeah. You know, and it, it's... So it's like, you know what? I pray about it every single day. I hit my knees and I pray about it. And I'm like, it's in God's hands now. And and that's not, but you still have to do footwork. You still have to be, you know, and, and it's not like, you know, hey, yeah, God, uh, make me very wealthy or whatever. And, you know, money, you, know, you got to work. <laughs> well, you know, asking for clarity, right? And asking yeah. for guidance. Yeah. You know, and I like that you pointed out where, you know, you take the opportunity to to ask for this and from your god and and whatever that is to you yeah. um, you know the people's idea about a god or a higher power or a power greater than themselves you know um it hangs people up a lot you know? i know it, it totally did with me man in recovery you know where it I can was, be an excuse for a lot of people well, i was you know my ego would right. not allow me to realize that the the whole extreme of my entire life was not in my control Right. You know, like, right. when I look at it now, I think, you know what, whether, like, I mean, when I look at what happened to the pandemic, like, how could I control? Right. Like, I would have taken credit for climate change. Right. It's a God truth. And so, right. I, um, so for me, looking at some of that stuff really helps me yeah. manage, you know, where the things that are like such low hanging fruit, you know, there are things that used to really hang me up when I look back now and think, Oh, isn't that cute? Right. My, my whole day was, really <laughs> right. you know, and thank you. Right. right. You know, just, I, um, I, I just realized that I've been talking way more than I want to be because you're still, no, you're right. sharing great stuff. Well, even, you know, I think we get each other in a big way. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, Let's talk about then, you know, you, I asked about you hitting the bottom because I find that I've hit several bottoms over right. and over, over again. And uh, and the ability to recognize those things sometimes is more manageable when you get there because you realize that you had some tools, you know, and, right. and so, like the number, the crisis line number, those aren't going to provide you a whole lot of tools immediately, but that's a path and that's a start because yeah. it seems insurmountable when you feel like the whole world's on your shoulders yeah. and you want to be able to hike Everest, you know, if you've got to start yeah. base camps along the way. And I'm betting more than anything else, when you told me what you've got going on in Michigan next week, that's a part of this sort of conversation, right? Can you tell me a little bit about what you're doing up there? Yeah, I'm uh, actually, um, was supposed to speak at this event and it's, it's, it's the, their website is UFA Michigan.org okay. and it's United to face addiction, um, Michigan. Uh, and it's an organization that this is their fifth annual, um, uh, event that they have for, you know, bringing awareness and facing addiction and stuff like that. So I was supposed to speak in May of the COVID year. Okay. And it got postponed because everything was like the whole country was shut down. Yeah. So then we were thinking about doing it last year and there were, and, and then I think it wasn't, it was the D variant or something. It wasn't Omicron, Omicron yet or whatever it was. It was the other variant had started coming through Michigan and the country. And then they were kind of like, it, it might be hit or miss, like whether we, whether we even do the event. Yeah. So I was like, well, Let's just do it when we know we can do it. So here we are two years later. And then finally, 
we get to do it. And so I'll, I'll go fly into Michigan next Tuesday night. And like my keynote is at the Lansing Capitol on Thursday at the event. Um, but on Wednesday, I get to talk to um, a collaboration of, I want to say, about 16 high schools where they bring their top like students and student athletes and like people or, or kids that are in school that are like leaders at their school and basically talk to them about my experience. And, um, you know, and a lot of that like talk for that group will lean towards, you know, not just drug and alcohol red flags, but leadership and adversity because they've already experienced adversities. Sure. At this point, everybody in this country has experienced adversity. Now nobody can say they haven't. And if, planet, you know, on the planet, right? Yeah. So it's, um, so that, you know, that'll be, and it's supposed, you know, with coaches and students and all that stuff, they're talking somewhere between 1,500 to 2,000 people. And that'll be like Wednesday at noon. I think that's more of a private scheduled event or like a school-based event. And then uh, in the afternoon, I'm speaking with some people from the judicial system um, that are specifically related to cases like this, like, you know, drug and alcohol abuse or fentanyl or whatever the case may be. Um, and then... And then I'll stay in like Lansing uh, Wednesday night, and then Thursdays like was the original talk. We ended up adding some stuff, wow, yeah. um, because I was like, if I'm there, let's try to reach out to as many as we can. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and pan it kind of forward back to you big know, time. I mean, that's where you were at, right? I mean, yeah. I, yeah. Give me that URL again, if you don't mind. I was gonna pop. Yeah, that. it's it's uf like ufa okay michigan okay dot org. And that's uh, Unite to Face Addiction is the acronym. I'm putting it up there on the on the site, guys. If you're, uh... but you spelled Michigan wrong. Oh shoot! <laughs> <laughs> you can make drummer jokes if you want. <laughs> right. Mich- Rarely will I catch a typo. <laughs> no, that's right. that's right there, Michigan. M I C H I G A N. Yep. There we go. Um, I, uh, and I'll make sure too that when I archive this at accesskevin.com that I've got a link to that. I think awesome. anybody needs to be able to, to see kind of what's going on there. Um, I'm really proud to see, you know, what you've been able to do with, you know, your story. I mean, yeah. I, I ask guys on the show a lot about legacy. Mm-hmm. Um, what does it mean to you? Well, it's, it's for me, it's extremely important. Um, you know, how I, I talked about it a lot more before the pandemic, probably because, you know, we're out intermingling a lot more with people. So you start talking about what's the legacy you want to leave behind. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've, I've come to find that you talked about, you know, how I've had a lot of adversity in my life, probably, I mean, maybe, maybe not more than your average person. It's just more visible because it's on a front page or, or something, yeah. but tr- adversity is adversity. Some are bigger than others. Like when I was growing up in grade school, a pop quiz was an adversity in the, yeah, in the right. class. Like I was like, Oh geez, like I right. should have read that chapter. Right. right. Yeah. So like that was a stressor and, and kids, any, if there's any kids listening, they'll relate to that. Right. Exactly. So I got to a point where once I got sober and started still having some adversities, had some great, great things happen and great successes and ups and downs and, and life. It's basically life happening. Um, I came to the point where I welcome adversity. Yeah. I don't go out looking for it, but I welcome it because I know what on the, on the other end of adversity comes growth. Okay. And I know that I will grow and, and it may not, it may be an adversity and it may not have a great solution, but I will, sit down and I will take a pen to the paper or a pencil to the paper and be like, what part did I play in this? Yeah. What was my side of the street? Where could I improve my stuff? You bet. You know, and, and because like you said earlier, you can't control the other party yeah. or your employer or other, whatever the case may be, sure. but what can I do to improve myself? And how do I compare? Like, I don't want to compare myself to, to Kevin Rankin. I want to compare myself to Tony yesterday. Yeah. 
Have I improved from yesterday? Am I going in the right direction from where I was yesterday? Even if it's in small incremental things. As long as I'm moving forward, that stuff compounds and over time, you get a lot better. So I welcome adversity. I don't go looking for it, but I welcome it. I won't be a doormat. Yeah. You know, there's there's a time and a place where it's like, you know, it's like you got it's that fine line of being having some graciousness and grace or becoming, you know, stomped upon by somebody. Yeah. So, um, but the, uh, God, when you say that, it's hard for me to imagine somebody stomping on you. Well, <laughs> trust me, Reggie White did. <laughs> Okay. Okay. You, you know, I mean, bigger, right? and, and you know what, if, if uh, there couldn't have been a better guy to do it because he's, he was a true pro and a true, like professional, like human being all, all the way around on and off the field. But, um, he was great. Uh, but yeah, it's, I always know that with great adversity will come, you know, after the adversity happens and it may not be for a while, but there's a lesson to be learned there. And, you know, my mom passed away in 2017 from Alzheimer's and, you know, it's like, I went into kind of like, you know, work mode of, you know, making sure all the arrangements were right, doing this, doing that, you know, flew back to Canada, did all that. And, and so then when I came back to Arizona a few days later, because immediately I had a huge photo shoot for a company like literally the next day after I came back. So I was in Canada seven days. And so that kept me busy. But then when I finally had time about 10 days after she had passed um, to sit down is when it really kind of hit me like shit, you know, mom's gone. Yeah. And that was July 4th of 17. Mm. So where it kind of hit me again was in November. Cause in November I'd always buy a ticket flight ticket to go back to Canada for Christmas to see mom, not every Christmas, but most Christmases. Yeah. And so habit wise, I'm like, okay, well, let me get online, check prices. And I'm like, you know, wait, there is no mom's not there. You know? So it's like, that's kind of like where it hit me again. And I went through a seven, I'd say six or seven month, real tough time, like downtime. Yeah. You know, I don't want to say it was depression, because depression is like a clinical, like there's like legit, I was down. I mean, I was really down. Um, and I just kept hitting, just kept rinsing and repeating every day, hitting my knees, you know? And at one point I was like doing nothing. Yeah. Like it was hard to get out of bed. That's, that's depression, bud. That's paralysis. R right. Right. Yeah. And um, I'm just going to plug this in so the battery doesn't die. There we go. Um, so, uh, I just at one point was like, you have to put one foot forward and then the next foot, you got to start moving. And I did. And I kind of took the same kind of uh, comparisons of when I first got sober. And I was like, you know, you got to move, even though you're going through withdrawals, you got to move. And I didn't drug or anything or drink. And I always knew I was always like, God, I don't know what the lesson is in this, but I know there's one. And whether it's revealed three months from now or three years from now, I'll look back and I'll be like, okay, that was the lesson in it. Yeah. And about seven months after that, about maybe a year later after her passing, it kind of hit me out of the blue, the revelation of what it was during that real dark seven months for me. Never did it, it once cross my mind to stick a needle in my arm, to pick up a drink or a drug. Yeah. Never, it never even crossed my mind. Yeah. And it's because I was like, it's, that does not bring her back to life. Totally. Yeah. You know, it, it will not help. And it no, worse. And it'll only do worse. Yeah. And that was for me, the lesson. That's a beautiful thing. I'm you know, really, and on, you know, I mean, if you took it one step further too, knowing that your folks just, you know, obviously loved and supported you and, yep. and knowing that that legacy again, if it, you know, had she tragically not passed away, yeah. you know, what, what would she be thinking about the decisions? Right. You made? Right. You know, right. And, I mean, that's not something you really think about when you're in insane state of mind, but right. it's a beautiful thing that the yeah. the drink was gone and, right. and numb it. Right. Because right. It's important to understand how to be in the pain right? and, you know, to do something with it. I mean, that for me, I mean, nobody likes to be in the pain. It's right. Right. It, it does. It does. In the midst of it all. And, 
you know, when you get on the other side, you can look back and go, man, right. that was like, that was a, you know, an, a life lesson that, yeah. you know, I talked about the trajectory and, and cause I think about Everest all the time, right? Mm -hmm. My whole concept of having to overcome adversity was like, you know, I, I, cause you'll laugh but like one of my heroes, man, is, is Mr. Rogers, right? I love right. Mr. Rogers. Right. He's, he's a badass man. Right. Like, right. You know, the, the Gandhis and the mother Teresa's and, and, <laughs> you know, and like they're, they're the ultimate in, in unconditional love. Right? Yeah. If I could be there, I would hold, I would hope to get there, but I'm never going to be Gandhi. I'm never going to hit Everest. Right. But if I can continue the upward trajectory towards that, maybe I'll hit a base camp of somewhere near Mr. Rogers by the end of my life. Right, right, you know? right, 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 right. That dude, I mean, you know, that guy would always find positivity and kindness, yeah. someone, you know, and, and I, yeah. like resentments are, are a huge part of my thing. And I, I try to let that stuff go, but you they're, know, yeah, they're a poison. Resentments are poison. They are, man. I, it's like, I'll show you while I'm poisoning myself. Right. And it's like, man, it doesn't do anything to help. No, me. it doesn't. I, uh, how cathartic is your photography for you? It's it, it's it's probably very similar, and I'm assuming, you know, it'll as your music is to you, you know, my photography screams my history. Yeah, it just screams it and conveys all different like times in my life. Like I can see a picture or a comp, you know, composite that I did or did a whether I did color grading on it or just made it simple and clean and bright and high key or dark with dramatic one light effect or whatever. It doesn't matter what it is. I can tell you what exactly what I was thinking about or what that reminds me of in my life. Really? Yeah. Can I put you on the spot? Absolutely. Is people might not know this, man. Somebody in the chat just now asked about this, but yeah, like I have always been a huge fan of your photography, but I'm going to share your site if you're cool with it, man. Oh, absolutely. I, um, your photography blows my mind here. So I want to ask you a little bit about a couple of these pieces, because if you really can kind of go back and, and be, you know, in the mindset of like, you're at least point out where your mindset was at that point. Yep. Um, yep. So let me get to it here. All right. Um, I'm going to jump down maybe to one of the first pictures I remember taking a look at it. This one, this one is the entire composition that blows my mind. Of course you get right. it you know, the attractive lady, this is stunning. So tell me about stealth. Tell me about this piece and what was going on through your mind when you, you worked on this piece. So she was, you know, she was shot in the studio. Okay. And, uh, no, um, with video green screens, great with photography, you want 50% gray Okay. or, or you want white wall, but the lights are falling off. Like the lights are far enough from the wall that, you know, the wall will start to turn darker the luminance will be like darker so it'll feel grayer it's just it's just better for blending and for selection okay because she's standing in my studio what, yeah right I, and that plane's in iceland right that's like that plane is like one of the few backgrounds like i've probably got 10 percent of the backgrounds of the pictures are ones that i didn't take okay so this one is an iconic picture of a of a plane um in iceland like currently still and it's it's been like all over the internet probably since 95 since the internet started becoming a little bit more mainstream but um but i, I envisioned this and you envisioned her in front of that company? no no i didn't right. but i was like somewhere i'm going to use that plane with the right person and the right thing gotcha. and for me it's like this i don't know if this this plane could have been intact at one time you know, the front end looked pretty, like it wrecked. Yeah. But you can tell that the wing was taken off, sure. like by people. Yeah. So for me, a lot of it reminds me of, in my life, how things pretty much crashed and burned. Mm -hmm. And when you strip away all the BS and all the things that you think are important, you got this raw, empty hull or cabin or kept body, right? Yeah. And it's like you're drained spiritually emotionally physically and you got nothing left and um so the whole feel and the color grading and the way she's looking back at her like for me it's like looking back on my life okay but you know this is my you know story in this image wow. the great thing about 
you know, art or photography is everybody can have their own perception of what, how it relates to them or what they see. Sure. Right. Yeah. That's art. And the thing is I did call it stealth mm -hmm. and I threw the Ravens in cause Ravens have a very special meaning in my life. And I don't know if you noticed it, but in between the three birds, I put in a stealth bomber. Yes, I see it. This so is... at a very low opacity. Yeah, right. So it's like you, you know, it's like the stealth bomber is considered like a modern, you know, modern day, like incredible, like uh, you know, creation compared to a plane like this that had, right. you know, it might have been a turbine and everything, but it's like old and junky and clunky. But you can still fly with the stealth. Yeah. Right. And and so. There's a lot of meaning to it, and the ravens mean a lot to me, even though, you know, to some people it, it may not really mean anything. But for me, it's like looking back at life, crashing and burning, and still being able to take off. Wow. You know? That's, I, I had no idea how autobiographical that was. That's beautiful, man. I, yeah. Yeah. It, you know, some people might kind of picture these being um, – so I was going to go back to a couple of these, um, you know, because you when um, when I first saw your photography years ago, you know, you were focused a lot on on attractive models, mm -hmm. not just not just female. I mean, men and women both mm -hmm. are just in, in in just prime physical shape. Like, you know, this woman has done more sit ups. <laughs> <than I do. laughs> so, I, uh, uh, when you take a shot like this, I mean, it's. Um, Again, we've got the Ravens there. I see them yeah. Here, here, this is profile. Uh, right. What's, what's going on with this one? Well, you know, uh, this like this girl's like nutrition is off the charts. Yeah. Like it's a really her nutrition that makes her look like that, right? And as far as in her, her. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. But um, you know, the car definitely predates my era. So that's like definitely an older car. To me, it'd be a Galaxy 500 that I would relate to or a Dodge Dart, right? Or something like that. Yeah. Um, so for me, this one doesn't have as much for me, my personal thing. But it's definitely, you know, part of the looking to the side is always reflecting. Because okay. you're reflecting on something. Sure. Or you're looking at something. A lot of my pictures, there are people that are looking directly at the camera, but just as many, if not more, they're not looking, they're looking away. Because yeah. to me, it leaves more to the viewer to interpret for, from their own personal experience. And so like this one isn't as, for me, like doesn't tell as much of that story as I could tell in the first one. Sure. But it definitely comes from, in my opinion, you know, the green tint on the windshield, mm. you know, was added. Yeah. Um, the whole image was desaturated to take away the color out of the vehicle. I think the orig that original vehicle was like a Tiffany blue. Oh, wow. um, so I took it out and, and, you know, I don't think the headlights were on. I made the headlights like on, right, yeah. in on post-production in Photoshop. Sure. Um, and she was leaning, her hand was on a toolbox okay. at, at the studio. So behind her, it was like a flat, flat top toolbox. It was like four feet long on wheels. Sure. And the and a white wall behind her, nice. And the, everything else you see in that picture, like the birds, are a separate image. The clouds are a separate image, or the sky, I should say, from the horizon up. And then the car is a separate image, and they were all. And she is a separate image, so they were all put together. Yeah, like people that uh, you know get into deep fake, you know, photos and yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're gonna be like, hey, we need to hire Tony to uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole different animal. <laughs> I would not consider it art. I mean, it seems like it's being used for yeah. nefarious purposes. But That's a problem. Grab, grab me, uh, you know, in as we look through these, because... Well, the, we, uh, go ahead. No, the like even the one on the right, the teal-colored one. Yeah, right there. Yeah. So that is, I titled it, I believe, Wrath. Wrath. And that's one of the... It's a self-assignment project I did for for the seven deadly sins okay wrath being one of them so i extended like literally she's leaning on that same toolbox oh. <laughs> okay except you could see her fingers are way longer yeah so i like made them longer in photoshop at increments to make them look as realistic as as fakely realistic as possible if that makes sense yeah absolutely. um that background picture 
that Raven was added on the right. Obviously, the Grim Reaper on the left was added. Um, but that picture was taken in the middle of the day in Michigan with a bright, clean sky um, in a bay. Uh, day, it was actually Christmas Eve of 2016. Um, I was there visiting my daughter, and um, I had had some free time where I was going to go out and shoot. And so it just landscapes. And so I was shooting this landscape and I found these trees that looked like they were uprooted and flipped in and turned and stuck back into the water upside down. So those trees are like really like that. Wow. Um, but her hair, a lot of her hair that's blowing on the side, I just duplicated and added more hair because she, her hair wasn't that long. That makeup and the darkness, she's a makeup artist also, this, this young lady. Um, I had enhanced it to make it look more grimacing, but she knew everything that I wanted as far as, look, this is the end game. We're doing wrath and we're going to try to, you know, have the interpretation of what wrath is. Oh, man. And that's why I made her finger is very wicked looking and like witchy and her eyes. Yeah. That's piercing. Like, oh my God. That, yeah. The, um, you know, I, people know this. I've got this link down at the bottom here already, but the, uh, the link that you can get to look at Tony's Tony Um, there's an incredible amount of photography there and walking into that gallery, you know, and, and getting your behind the scenes on a few of these things, it's, it's special, man. You know, Thank you. Uh, um, I, I've got a dear photographer friend here in Portland too, who, um, you know, he's, he, he's got a vision for backdrops, you know, oh. you walk into his studio and it looks like he's got, you know, like, you know, these Roman pillars and, right. you know, Viennese, like, um, you know, the architecture, but it's in, and I hope I'm not outing him because I think he, he opened up about this when I, I talked to him about it. Um, you know, it's a storage unit. And, and so he's, mm -hmm. you know, this, so and, and yeah, makes it, it makes it more impressive actually to me by <laughs> I, his wife is basically, you know, a set yep. and, and uh, and I watch his interaction because I've I've been there watching yeah. as a as a photographer. Um, he's got models that he works with often that really get him. There's something mm -hmm. that happens, this unspoken thing that happens between the photographer and yeah. the model when they're on the same page, and it's it's it, it blows my mind. You yeah. know, that that a, and a model can articulate a particular uh, vibe just with the look of her eyes. Yeah. And uh, um, but I watch how he is with with them too and directing them certain ways they can get a very sensual sort of yep without it making it seem gratuitous like you right know, you know and that's what i see in your work too you know yeah you yeah to objectify and you know a woman i mean there's beautiful women and yeah. men in your photography that yeah um, that you know it's not just eye candy i mean at all no it's like i you know it's like i always want to i mean if, if at the end of the day whatever image you know, I get to choose what images go on my website. Yeah. So there's a lot of people I shoot that I don't put on my website because it's like they don't fit what I want on my website. That doesn't mean they're, that, you know, I don't find that I don't think that they were attractive enough or nothing. It's like because I wanted, I want, like, when somebody sees a picture or a final composite or an image to be like, damn, like, like, how does that affect me? Like, yeah. in, in my, personal life when that person is looking at that picture what is that how does that affect me right and um and art being so subjective it's that's what makes it so awesome in my opinion it's like you know yeah i mean it's same for music the art of music and sure. yeah. my dad's a painter a sculptor a printmaker you know and awesome and, and he's an abstract expressionist you know so right. he, his his work is not so literal that it's not telling a story overtly, you know, right. so it's not saying this is what you have to see when you see right. piece. And, and, um, you know, as a younger sort of, uh, witness to his work, it didn't make as much sense to me. Right. I wanted to be told what it is. Right. And, and a lot of people like that with art, you know, they don't, yeah. want, they, they, uh, they like to be force fed something. They, they, yeah. don't, they don't want to go see a movie that, right. you know, that has, you know, depth in the plot line. They just want to right. blow shit up in front of me and make right. it. Like, <laughs> well, you know, and there was even a, there was a, a time where I really struggled with, as soon as you put a title to an image yeah. or a phrase, sure. you're already steering somebody. Sure. 
So, I mean, I struggled, you know, I, I didn't lose sleep over it, but I struggled internally and, and, you know, thought about it over long periods of time of, do I want to influence the impact of this image with words? And sometimes, and I'd say half the time, the answer is yes. Okay. And half the time, the answer is no. And it just depends on the image. You know, part of that is, you know, it's your work. You know? Yeah. It's nice that you get that creative space to be able to do that, the, art, the artistic license, you know? Yeah. But, uh, I, um, I think, you know, I asked if it was cathartic because, again, I mean, you, you've gone through phases in your life, you know, where, you know, there are peaks and valleys and some things have been, you know, more challenging. Yeah. When it, are you able to say, okay, today, today is a, it's a tougher day than others. I just need to go out and shoot. Is there a place that you kind of go to in your mind where you're thinking, all right, I'm going to grab this camera and I'm going to go out in, uh, you know, I'm going to Sedona and I'm just going to get some right. landscapes, you know, is that, is that a, a kind of a, there was a time there was there was a time when I did that for probably a, a decade okay um, and believe it or not and Sedona's probably my most favorite place on the planet um, it's only you know for me it's an hour and a half drive but uh, believe it or not like I literally love the simplicity of grabbing doesn't matter which camera I have yeah. as long as it's an SLR um, and as long as I can put a 50 millimeter lens on it a fixed 50 millimeter and just go shoot and just leave with just the, that camera and that lens and not shoot anything else. And I love shooting street photography. Oh, wow. Yeah. Absolutely love it. It's like if it's rainy or, or, you know, the moodier, the better. Yeah. Right. And the more something can look surreal. Um, I like it. Uh, Cause sometimes I've had things in my life happen where I'm like, did that just really happen? Some great things and some not so great things. That's the story of my life, bro. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right up until the time you and I met. That's right. Right. <laughs> you know, but then, and then there's places like, like right down the street from me, about three miles, there's a really, really nice area of Scottsdale. It's called Kierland. Okay. And they have another right beside it. There's another like shopping area called Scottsdale quarter and they're outdoor shops. They're real, they're high end. Yeah. They're a beautiful place to go and walk around and everything. So in the middle of summer, when all the, because a lot of them, these places are restaurants and they'll have um, like the misters outside on the patios. Right. Well, if you get there, it, you can have your, your camera phone from your, uh, because they're so good now. Yeah. And when all those misters are going, like they flood the street where you can only see about, 50 yards, half a football field ahead of you. And then everything just goes into mist from all the misters because they're just like slamming because it's like 115 degrees out. And when the sun's going down, it starts to color that mist. It is like, it's like, it's like I stumbled on it. I wish I could say, hey, I thought it out and I was like, hey, I'm going to go there. And I stumbled. <laughs> I cleared this time. Right. I was like, Whoa. And I started snapping pictures with my, um, I think at that time I, I still had an iPhone. Okay. I've been using Android the last four, three, four years, but the quality was so good that I was like, okay, the best phone, the best camera that you really do have is the one that's on you. Yeah. Right. And, and we're not going to carry our digital SLRs around with us. Right? right. I mean, unless I'm in with intent going out to shoot, I literally stumbled on that scene and I was like, this is jaw dropping. And I was like, it went into my phone, changed everything to the highest resolution, shooting in raw, you know, most megapixels. Do you know that this will take up a lot of your like space on the phone? I'm like, yes, I know. You know I don't care. <laughs> right. So yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy. And then, and then you can obviously come back with your camera that has the ginormous amount of megapixels. If you want to shoot it in HDR or whatever. And, shoot in different exposure compensations and, and cap start capturing what you're going to use for a background. You're so passionate about it, man. I love it. You know, I do love it. It's, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, I, for me, my kids, uh, both of my kids were musical, but a lot of my friends would say, well, yeah. So what do your kids want to do with music? My, my oldest son, Caleb, uh, was an amazing drummer, you know, it's still right, is, he, right. right behind the camera here. He's got this huge Neil Peart, you know, rush replica rush. Yeah. And, but he, he got into hip hop and rap and he's got like a third record coming out and nice. And 
I think it was because he wanted to get as far away from the stuff his dad was doing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Get it. I don't <laughs> care. My kids are into as long as they're passionate about yeah. it. Yeah. Just yeah. 100%. You know, and I bet you're like me. I mean, you were dedicated from day one to be the greatest NFL offensive lineman that was on the planet. Um, now I consider you one of the greatest photographers I've ever seen. In my oh, life. thank you. More importantly, dude, you're paying stuff forward. You know, you're sharing your yeah. story where – people that might even get a glimpse of hope from some of the messaging. Yeah. Got. You know, I love that you're talking to kids in Michigan. Yeah. I think it's going to be a great thing for them. Something that they're not going to forget. You know? Hopefully not. And, and, you know, it's, uh, as, as we get older, you know, we're, and we're, we still got a lot of years left. You and I, I mean, we're getting older, but we're not, you know, we're just over halfway there. Yeah. I like to say, Absolutely. so it's like, you start to realize, and I don't want to say the real important things in life, but you start to realize things that are a lot less important. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then which you know narrows the road yeah. for you or for me and, and you and or whoever. And we start to say, okay, what is important? Mm -hmm. Well, why don't I dedicate some of my time over here? You know, because time is the most valuable thing we have. We can't get it back. Right. And... You know, if someone is willing to stop and share with you, whether it's on a one-on-one -on -one individual basis or in a group session or with a couple people, it's like I value those people's time and I respect it. And I would, it's like I want to surround myself with people that feel the same way. Totally. Because it's like if I'm not, then I'm surrounding myself with the wrong people. Or if I'm not to them, then they're surrounding themselves with me being the wrong person. Yeah. So it's... um. It, it's it, and it also you know keeps me sober it keeps me on point and on track and does it keep me I, or no keep me it doesn't even it doesn't make you anybody perfect but it keeps you striving in the direction of good yeah and it, you know it's like right. it's service work and and that's what it's really at the end of the day for me when i look at the the real big picture the biggest picture of all for me and all those years, since 11 years old, dedicated to football. And now at 55, I look back and I go, someone had a bigger plan than I did. And they're using, and the reason I did football, and I acknowledge football, and I love it, and I appreciate it, but it was really a platform to be able to carry a message of service. Yeah. At the end of the day, for me. For sure, man. I mean, that, you know, you know. Um, I, I've said this on my show before, but my, one of my favorite sayings ever, uh, and you probably heard it because it was a big viral thing that went around for a while, but Jim Carrey had talked to a bunch of graduating students and marketing students, and the whole idea about their marketing degrees, right, is to sell and make money. And right. said the most important thing, he said, you know, the effect you have on others is the greatest yeah. form of currency there is. And that he had the benefit and the wisdom of experience, right? Yep. He recognized that he'd had the peaks and valleys of his success and yep. and somebody who's retired now, right, from comedy and from yeah. because he realized what's important. Yeah. You know, if we and it goes back to the first conversations we had about accountability and recognizing how we want to be treated and how we would treat others. And yeah. um, I think I would just, you know, implore folks, you know, to kind of look at that in the next time, you know, that they're, yeah. they're wanting to lash out on social media or they're, you know, I mean, really, you know, families, a lot of families are struggling right now with mm -hmm. siblings and children and parents. And, um, you know, there's a lot of divisiveness amongst a lot of people, but in families, it's really important to recognize patience and take a breath and, you know, and be willing to listen. You mentioned those things. And I think, um, I, I really do feel like there's so many valuable lessons that could be gained from just this this time with you here, man. And Thank you. I wish I could be in those uh, those rooms in Michigan. But you know what? I would really love if you're cool with it. Um, I I have a couple of other dear friends right in your neighborhood, man. That yeah. I, have, I desperately need to catch up. Kelly Kiki, drummer from Night Ranger, is in your. He's right around the corner from you, and. I love that man like a brother, and um, you can still rock in America. Yeah, I can. <laughs> he's he's, uh, he's they're they're out touring a ton, but you know we've talked about a lot of this, and and I think uh, you know we're we're fellow brothers. Abs so, absolutely, so, absolutely. So I want to do this in person again. I'm going to come down to Arizona. There are some friends I need to see. 
I want to go and just see the misters with you. Can yeah. We, can we do a follow up one of these days? Absolutely. Absolutely. I would, I would be honored. You and I are due for, you know, the, yep. the, another, <laughs> another catch up session. And you, can, you can show me how to eat right. <laughs> <laughs> Girl, Listen, she's holistic and she eats so well, man. It's a beautiful thing because does she wait. Does she eat meat? Yeah. Okay, she's she, good. She's yeah. good. <laughs> she asked me if I was interested in going, uh, you know, plant based for a bit right. to get rid right. of some of the stuff. And, and for sure, yeah. Um, you know, I've had a friend who who's done a lot of you know yeah. healthy changes with red meat removed from his his. Yeah. Diet. Yeah. I love meat. I grew up in Montana. I was just in Montana, you know, yeah. 12 hours ago or 24 hours ago. Yeah. And, uh, it's going to be hard for me not to eat. Yeah. Meat. Hey, look, the science shows the plant based, plant based, you're going to, the longevity and health is off the charts good. Yeah. And I don't challenge it. Yeah. But I, I'm willing to trade some days and years sure. for the stakes. Yeah. And, and, and trust me, the steaks are not nearly like they used to be. Like as far as how many I'm eating, it's it's very little red meat these days compared to how it was. But I mean, yeah, the plant based does obviously carry a lot of value. But uh, I don't it's not that I couldn't do it. I, I, I just don't want to do it. Yeah. And I, and I don't want to even speak like there's nothing even to speak bad about it. You know, I was joking when I said, I hope she eats yeah. meat at least. Right. Oh, yeah, no. But, but it's like, it, you know, you get good meat that's like organic and not pesticide, no steroid, no, you know, antibiotics shot up, all that stuff. That's some good stuff. My, my downfall is, is carbs like pasta, dude. I'm just like, right. man, but I'll tell you, you mentioned it. You mentioned that Sedona is your favorite place. The greatest steak I've ever had in my life was just passed up in Jerome at the asylum. Oh yeah. And when I saw you that weekend, I, my yeah. wife and I drove up to Jerome and the place that used to be an insane asylum is now yeah. this amazing steak restaurant. Yeah. And I had the best filet mignon to yeah. this day, man. I'll never yeah. forget it. And then I, and I grew up in Montana where that's some good right. steak. Yeah. 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 Good. Yeah. But, well, and that's right, and that's attached to that haunted hotel. Right, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Man, Jerome's one of the coolest places. Love it, man. Yeah. yeah, we'll have to go up there and maybe have a conversation with Maynard. You know, we'll, yeah, uh, we'll, I'd we'll, love to. I would love to. Places. I do see in the chat, um, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you. Um, Peter Crop here is asking, um, what was your experience on Letterman like? You know, it was it was great. Um, the funny thing was, like, I watched Letterman every night. Yeah. And, and like for years and years before I was ever on Letterman. And then once SI came out and then I got drafted and all that stuff, you know, my agent calls me and says, my sports agent calls me and says, you know, the Letterman show call, they want, they want you to have you on as a guest. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah. I was like, heck yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it was like, you know, it was, it was really, it was one of those kind of really cool experiences. I, I really enjoyed it. And that was your Axel moment? <laughs> no, it, you know, I've only been starstruck twice. Yeah. Uh, one was Axel. And, but, you know, to me, they were like, and, and to me, they are. Like, they, I can put on Paradise City. I can put on Rocket Queen. I can put on favorite. just about any, Rocket Queen's my, my favorite song. My Out of favorite. all those, my, the, by far my favorite song. Bridge, that breakdown of the bridge. When yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> every time. Right. Now I don't know what you're talking about the bridge, but anyways, I know what you mean. <laughs> I know what I, I know what you mean. But it, dude, when I put that stuff on, my blood just rushes through my veins. Yes. Still yes. to this day, and it doesn't, and it's not necessarily like a, it takes me back to a place, but it just rushes, and it's just like it's like when you talked about your photographer friend when he deals with certain models, yes. they just get it, yes. and it's like when I listen to that, it's like it, it's like game on. Did you tell Axel that? I did. I, well, I talked about it in Sports Illustrated, and they were like, I mean, they were like, you know, like they were like thanking me for giving them good PR and SI because at that time you had no 50 million media outlets. SI was like the biggest sports outlet. Right. I was just telling SI, look, this is what I listen to. This yeah. is, you know, like this is the shit that I, you know, lift weights to. And so they had already made it. Like yeah. by six months, they had made it big, huge. Yeah. But they said, you know, their manager had said that helped keep them going like yeah. big yeah. because that SI cover was the third biggest seller of the decade of the 80s. Wow. So, you know, I, 
I ha- I have the uh, the the swimsuit the, models. Yeah, right, right. I beat I beat some of them. <laughs> I was a I was a swimsuit plus model. <laughs> <laughs> but you know i was like i still to this day you know i'm like well i believe they would have done just fine without any marketing from my end but it was like it didn't hurt yeah. the, the marketing but they were they were they were awesome man that was a starstruck moment and then there was another one that was on it but see that one was almost like expected when i met them sure. but the other one was totally unexpected and it still surprises me that but this person, and you'll know the name if you don't know who she is, Hope Solo. Oh, yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah. So I, I'm getting tutored by this photographer, uh, Joel Grimes, who's just off the charts, like makes just incredible vision and hard work and just really taught me a ton, so much about photography and, and post-production with compositing. Okay. Just a phenomenal guy, human being, his whole family. And... Um, so when I went up to Pasadena, when he was living in Pasadena, he's like, he had a, a shoot, a corporate shoot for this company that was making this stuff like that wraps around your shoulder, but there's like ice in it. And then there's custom ones made for your knee. Well, they had wanted, they had hired Hope Solo as the person to be their representative okay. for the photo shoot. So I was assisting Joel on this photo shoot. This was about 15, 16 years ago, okay. maybe, maybe 12, 13 years ago. And we got into the locker room and I was, I, I was like, are you kidding me? Like the presence that she demanded without opening her mouth was ridiculous. Wow. And it wasn't like, I mean, she's very outspoken and she, she's gotten herself in trouble and stuff, but I was starstruck at her presence. Yeah. Oh. It was like tier one. I know she's an Olympian, right? And all that stuff. But I'm like, I, I was like, I can't believe that I'm actually starstruck. By this person and it wasn't even like an attraction starstruck no, but i was crazy, dude. yeah I, I get it man there it was crazy you know, it doesn't have anything it doesn't have to be celebrity because you've you've been celebrity and you've been around celebrities you yep. know, dude. I mean, you were, yep you know you were playing with some of the greatest players yep. of all time and, and i was very and, lucky uh fortunate that was fortunate i was very fortunate <laughs> one bit of luck <laughs> seriously if you were lucky you wouldn't have put in all that time. I mean, you right. I, sorry. Yeah. I mean, that, no, no, I know what you mean. Yeah. But I, 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 some of us are lucky, you know, we were born yeah. in America, you know, right. with, with a lot of advantages and that kind of thing, but right. Right. Uh, but by no means don't, you know, discredit yourself for having, right. there. Um, but you know, a dear friend of mine, drummer, like he's a videographer and, and, and he's my, really the guy that inspired me to do almost everything I've done. Dan Pred, video media he was a drummer for the dan reed network way back in the day okay. bon jovi but he got hired to go up and work with the seahawks and he hates anything to do with sports you know, like he just has no interest in it right? Right. And, and he waited until he's at the seahawks facility to call me and tell me um do you know who richard sherman is i said yeah he goes dude this is crazy i'm up here shooting videos with richard sherman and marshawn lynch and Pete Carroll. And I, I said, shut the fuck up. And he said, two of the biggest beasts. Well, he, he, I mean, and actually, he said, like, all three of those guys, he said, Richard Sherman had some kind of energy that he right. said, I could, he said, I've never watched a fo- football game in my life. And I yep. want to see everything this guy's ever done now yep. because of the way he communicates. Yeah. His, his articulation is intelligent. very intelligent. And, and like, he had, he said, he because he was, had him on camera a lot. He said that he does this thing with his eyes. Right. Marshawn's kind of shifty, and he's you know he's kind of looking away from the camera. <laughs> right, right. Richard Sherman would look me in the eye, and I was hypnotized. Right. And, and then he said, the the infectious thing that Pete Carroll does. You know, he said, there's nothing you could do that right. didn't make you fall in love with. It. I mean, like right. every, every time Pete would speak, he'd say, okay, I, I'm in. What do you want me to do? You know, right. coach. He said, right. And and so, I uh, I think. You know, when somebody that's not familiar, like if you yeah. didn't know who Hope Solo was, but you stepped in that room, you still would have had the same feeling. Probably, you know, probably. Like, there are people like that in like yeah. in my life. Like even they don't even have to speak. Stevie Wonder did that to me once, in and I was in a room with him, and he walked by, and I got goosebumps. You know, wow, weird man. I, and I, uh, you know, I, there's yeah. there's un 
Yeah, yeah, it's it's. You know, it's like, how can you explain what that is, right? But right, it, yeah. But how fortunate are we? Oh my gosh! In life, man. I always say we would have missed it all. Yeah, buddy. We would have missed it all by our own undoing of drinking and drugging and whatever, you know. Yeah, man. Was taking us downhill, and it's like every time I have a moment like that, and it doesn't have to be like that starstruck moment, but every time like something really cool happens, I'm like, would have missed it. Yeah. I would have missed it. Man, count your blessings every yep. day. I, yep. I do. You know what, man? Yep. Just There's no guarantees, you yeah. know? It's like, it, 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 yes, definitely make a plan. Have a plan. But, you know, there's no guarantees to anything. That's the truth. And it's like, you know, keep today, like, precious and, and be aware of it. Plan for tomorrow, but be ready for anything. Man, I, I love it. Tony Mandrich. I freaking love you, man. You are Thank you, man. <laughs> I love you too. I can't wait to find out about how things go in Michigan next week. And I'm yeah. really, really, really I'm excited. Just thank you, man, for your, your honesty and your humility and putting all this positivity forward. Absolutely. Um, let, let's stay in touch because I'm going to come down. We're going to go. Uh, we'll check some misters. We'll go rock. Yes. Out. Yes. And uh, I love it. And, and, and show me how to eat a good steak, will you? Absolutely. <laughs> you got my number. Um, you know, you're welcome here anytime, my friend. Thank you, brother. Thank All right. Stay in touch. Thanks again. Guys, if you got here late, go to TonyMandrich.com. You can see the photography. If you go to UFAMichigan.org, you're going to see what Tony's doing next week. Yep. This will be up at AccessKevin.com in a little bit. So make sure you subscribe to this YouTube channel. Go and like it and hit the little bell. You'll be notified about the cool guests like this one. <laughs> Have a great week, guys. All right. Tony All right.